Why is this not a crime? What is this? How is it that we haven't criminalized mass damage and destruction to the earth? Ons gebruik van de aarde leidt ertoe dat we die aarde beetje bij beetje beschadigen en daarmee onze eigen leefomgeving in gevaar brengen. Maar de aarde is niet in staat zichzelf te verdedigen. Overal ter wereld zijn advocaten bezig daar verandering in te brengen. Zoals de Schotse Polly Higgins. Vijf jaar geleden gaf ze haar praktijk als advocaat op om zich volledig te wijden aan de rechten van de aarde. En dat begint met de vraag, is de schade die we aan de aarde toebrengen toelaatbaar? Why is it that if we've got a universal declaration of human rights, why don't we have the equivalent for the earth? I find myself thinking the earth is a need of a good lawyer. <laughs> and it, it was a thought that didn't leave me. Because the earth and communities right across the world, their voices aren't being heard. And I was recognizing that actually nobody was representing the interests of the earth as such in a courtroom. It's rather like representing, you know, for instance, in child care cases, you represent a child. Now, a two-year-old cannot give you an eloquent sentence as to what their needs are and how they're being harmed, but you can bring in a guardian ad litem that speaks on their behalf, and the indicators are there. So, for instance, a child who's been physically harmed is covered in bruises and cuts or, or has uh, brain damage. You know, this, this can be actually scientifically shown. And it's rather the same with the Earth. You can actually show scientifically that there is harm at play. You just have to look at images of the Athabasca tar sands to see that that land has been completely destroyed. How is it that corporations, uh, transnational organizations, are making lots of money out of causing mass damage and destruction to the Earth? And I'm thinking about heavy extractive industries, the, the energy industries. And I was speaking in Copenhagen at the climate negotiations in 2009, and it, it had been opened up to the audience asking questions. Someone in the audience said, we need a new language to deal with this mass damage and destruction. And this was like a light bulb moment. I found myself thinking, yeah, this is like genocide, only it's eco-side. Wow, that should be a crime. Why is this not a crime? I went down that rabbit hole of rigorous legal scrutiny. Could this be an international crime? What are the existing international crimes? Well, we've got genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Now we have crimes of aggression. It was put in place in 2010. You know, what if we had ecocide as an international crime? Polly Higgins is uitgenodigd door het laatste echte inheemse volk van Europa, de Sami. Zij wonen verspreid over vier landen. Noorwegen, Finland, Rusland en Zweden. Beter bekend als Lapland. Sweden, uh, I think, is a particularly interesting thing because they also have an indigenous culture there that's under threat, the, the Samai. And the, here within Europe, we have an indigenous culture still living off the land where the land really matters to them and they're now being threatened with super mining, um, ma major mining uh, that could destroy vast tracts of their territory. And this is an opportunity for me to meet direct those individuals who are, whose land is under threat, whose way of living with their land is under threat. So this is the cultural ecocide. Dit is Marie Persson. Zij en haar man zijn echte lappen. Ze leiden een modern leven, maar in perfecte harmonie met de natuur. Dat evenwicht wordt al jaren verstoord door bodemvervuiling, veroorzaakt door oude nikkelmijnen. Een ecocidewet zou haar en de Sami bescherming kunnen bieden tegen de aantasting van hun leefgebied. Uh, here is one part of the mining project. There are no buildings here. There are this canyon and this. You see how they have been digging in the landscape, taking out forest and everything. The whole project, uh, it, it, um, it ended after one and a half year, it was bankruptcy, totally. 
The main issue of the planned nickel mining project here is the environmental uh, one and the uh, the rights of the uh, indigenous people yeah. of the Sami. Yeah, no mining project has ever been stopped in Sweden in the in the last uh, environmental Sweden. assessment. In and here is my father. <laughs> Het wordt nog erger voor de lappen. De Zweedse overheid heeft een vergunning afgegeven voor een nieuwe nikkelmijn. Midden in hun leefgebied. King Knut. De vader van Marie, Knut Persson, leidt ons naar de plek waar de nieuwe mijn gebouwd gaat worden. Existing law puts the interests of the shareholder first. By law. So a company has to do that. And of course that means maximizing profit. I uh, was very little regard for for any other you know, member of the, the community that can be adversely impacted. So you could sit on a board of directors and say, hey, I don't feel too good about this mining project. I think this is going to pollute the water and you know, cause great atmospheric pollution. It's going to be really disastrous for these local Samis and their, their reindeer. And, you know, hey, the people downstream 200 kilometers away, it's going to be really significantly affect their, their drinking water, you know, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. What about future generations? <laughs> and, you know, and you, you, you know, the, the CEO will sit there and the lawyer advising will say, that's all fine and well, but your legal duties to your shareholders, you're going to maximize your profit. You know, don't worry about that. That's not a legal requirement. So this causes problems um, when this, wow. Wauw. Dat is amazing. At this part of our municipality, we have a, a very uh, big region, a big uh, municipality called mm -hmm. Storuman. And this uh, uh, part here in the west, we live. We are dependent on the nature and on the uh, tourism and everything, that people, mm. they come to work here or to live here and to stay here because of this, mm. because of the nature. Mm. So it's like cutting off the um, legs or something. Mm. And, and uh, where they are planning this huge nickel mine is right here. Right here. Right here, here, where, here we where we stand. Yeah. Okay. They have been drilling. If it wasn't uh, all this snow, we would see the, the drilling, the holes yeah. where they have been. We know that they will mine nickel, iron and cobalt. But we also know that uh, results of the, the course contains asbestos. You know what I'm hearing here is a, a really sad tale that I hear in many countries, many continents right across the world. Where beautiful pristine land, I mean, look at this magnificent landscape, is under threat of development. Uh, development that promises jobs, uh, promises money into the economy, the national economy. But at what price? And actually, it's not something you can put a price on. So in a way, what we have here are a few key people who are able to stand up and speak out as earth protectors, if you like. You know, they are the guardians of this land. And indeed, they are the ancient guardians of this land. But because they don't have a contract, because they don't have a piece of paper that has their name signing off on it, then other people can make decisions as to what happens here, regardless of what those who live in this land have to say because their voice isn't being heard. The Sami who live here, the land itself, once it's gone, it's gone. You know, it can never be returned. And there's a term for this that when culturally a community is destroyed through development, it's called solostalgia. I, when it's a collective trauma at play of the loss that can never be returned, of the damage and destruction that actually carries on through generations. Like nostalgia, but with solace. Solace is the pain of the heart. Holly Higgins is a former uh, business lawyer in London, 
she's currently spearheading a campaign uh, to bring a law of ecocide as the fifth crime against humanity and ultimately nature. It's great to have you here at our conference. Thank you. Please give Polly a big okay, hand. Thank you very much. Hello. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Hi. We're 700 people. Everyone works with legislation here. Oh, wow. So you're <laughs> at your home turf, okay? Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. What a delight to be in a room with 700 people who enjoy law. <laughs> what myself and, and a group of others are doing is we're seeking out not just one but a group of heads of state who can stand up and call for this and say, OK, now we want this document amended. There's a missing international crime here, a missing fifth crime, and that is ecocide. And we now call for that to be tabled. Because, of course, heads of states are you know, the representatives of nations. They're there to speak on behalf of their people as well. And not just for those who are alive here and today, but for future generations. This is a legacy issue, if you like. And it's a collective responsibility that civilization as a whole holds on our shoulders. Um, some of us may not know it, but in fact we do, you know, hold a responsibility for ourselves and for future generations to ensure that we leave this world a better place, not a worse place. The interesting thing is... When we look back into the annals of time, it's there and very nearly became an international crime in the 1990s. And it was only at the 11th hour that it was removed. By 1996, 11 years later, when there was really a large body of support for it, at a closed door meeting in the United Nations for the Working Group on Crimes Against the Environment, it was announced by the then head of the Working Group that ecocide law was going to be removed. Many countries stood up to object to this and demanded reasons. None were given. And ecocide was removed as a crime. There are records from the then UN rapporteurs who were involved in that meeting. And obviously they, they, they decided to put in a record of what their opinion was of what happened and they logged it into the United Nations basement. And we've now discovered these documents. And what they said was that four, maybe five countries had, in their opinion, lobbied behind the scenes to have it removed. Which countries? US, UK, France and the Netherlands. This was as a result of vested corporate interests who had vested reason um, to not have this law put in place so that they could continue with business as usual. Thank you very much for coming to our conference, Milia Thank, 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 so Thank, Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I realised that to stop vested interests um, doing the same again, it was very important that this proposal remain in the public domain. But actually, by putting it out in the public domain, it, it, it attracted energy straight back in. So suddenly I had uh, you know, people from across the world contacting me, lawyers and non-lawyers. And it, it became very clear to me that it, actually I was going to have to take this out to every country in the world. I think there's a window of opportunity here that we can use to move forward here. We've got the climate negotiations here in Europe and Paris. There, there's a window of opportunity to say there is another way here. Climate negotiations, 21 years on, it's not working. There's something that can, there's another way possible here that can actually take us to a safer place. And decoside law is that. Protect the wild, tomorrow's child. Protect the land from the greed of man. Take out the dams, stand up to oil. Protect the plants and renew the soil. Who's gonna stand up and save the earth? This all starts with you and Kijk de lange aflevering op onze website. Of bekijk deze twee andere video's van Tegenlicht Kort.
iedere week op de hoogte blijven van Tegenlicht Kort, abonneer je dan op ons kanaal.